Hi, my name is George Cosmatos and I'm the director of this film. When I was a little kid living in Italy, I always loved American westerns and I was influenced by them. We didn't have TV like you Americans had in the 40s. We had no TV until the 60s or something. So all the comic books and the old movies influenced me tremendously and all those wonderful stars like Robert Mitchum and Bill Holden and John Wayne. So when I was given the offer to do this movie, I jumped out of my seat. I said, wow, I'll do a Western. And in those days, it was very difficult to make a Western in Hollywood. I, mean, I thought Westerns were. Uh, well, here's the opening. The opening, I thought I would put some old film. I went to my friend, Michael Friend, at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science, and got old film and put it together to show the newsreel stuff of the period through old films. And that's, that's establishing the atmosphere of the period instead of using the old thing like photographs. And even here, if you can see, here's Kurt Russell. We age the film. Here's Val Kilmer in a bar. Here's Val Kilmer again, you'll remember him. So we use some of our footage and mix it with old stuff, like old films from very early, actually. This is a real footage here. And I want to do that because I wanted from those footage of black and white, I want to open the screen big with a gunshot and start the movie with a bang. So put the audience in the mood of excitement. They call themselves... If you start from here, it is boom, it goes open. And then the title comes. And that's, uh, especially on the big screens, a huge effect. So I hope you have a large television set or you should get one. This is the Mexican village. This happened by chance. I was going to shoot another scene with the old man Clanton of the head of the cowboys. And Robert Mitchum was going to play it, one of my favorite stars of all time. But he got sick and he couldn't do it. So we didn't have an Ike Clanton. So we rearranged the scene and made it into this. In all Tucson studios was this church. So we figured a whole new scene. You see the boots here? I like the detail in film. Detail sells a lot. The guy, you know, he's a card player. You know, the guns, the detail of the shots the people watching so you're creating an atmosphere and you don't know what's happening an atmosphere of danger suddenly the doors open they look in the bright sunlight they think they'll be happy and instead of that there's all this people watching them the cowboys what we call the bad guys of that period and this is the last of them they, they were, this was like the last few years of the bad guys in, in the west so here is Ringo, one of the greatest gunmen, Curly Bill, played by, by Powers Booth, and he shows them the red uh, sashes they wear, the, the mark of the cowboys. Y'all kill two cowboys. It was very bright that day, and I tried to dark here. Here's the gunshots, and it's, a big gunfight starts. I use the crosses in the church, I use the atmosphere. And you see now here are the crosses and with the children crying to, uh, to strengthen the scene as much as I could. Although it was done haphazardly with the scene, we just had to shoot it fast where, where we didn't have the scene before. It was the other scene with Robert Mitchum. That's why I also wanted him at the end even to do the narration. Anything with Robert Mitchum in the movie would have been good for me. And here they go and you establish all of them. We try to make them as authentic as possible from the movies and not copy other westerns with other mistakes. Every single cloth was worn many times, aged so it doesn't look brand new as if it came out of sacks, shop window. And the moustaches, look at this moustache. These are real moustaches. No moustache was added in the whole movie. These guys grew their own moustaches because somebody once said, ah, look at all this phony. It's not true. Those were all real moustaches. And uh, here's the scene that they show how they intimidate people, they shoot the groom, the ultimate of evil. And if you notice, one of them, one of those guys now will look, and we establish a little bit of character just by visual and what they say, a little bit of how evil these guys are. And there's one guy who doesn't like it, what's going on, and he, I'm selling a point for later in the film, that he will turn against them maybe, or whatever. Here's the white shot with the priest. The priest, by the way, is Pedro Armendariz Jr. He's the son of Pedro Armendariz, the famous Mexican actor who did so many John Ford westerns, like Three Godfathers and all those kind of great movies of John Ford. Michael Bean plays Ringo. Pars Booth plays Curly Bill. Spanish is worse than your English. 
You go to hell! You first. Shoots again. And then they move away and there's uh, the dining table all prepared for the for the feast. And I thought it would be a great contrast. But here is the guy looking and you can see he doesn't like it. And I'm selling it a little bit that something is going to happen with him. Then they go under the canopy and they look at the food that was for all the guests, which is the ultimate insult. And they sit there. And also the canopy with the silk on top gives it a warm glow to the scene instead of that bright sunlight. And here's Pedro Mendez Jr. again giving them the bail rider discussion. And we move slowly to Ringo explaining what the pale rider thing is about somebody who's going to come in revenge or save people. It's quoting the Bible. Revelations. Behold, the pale horse. The man who sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. You'll see now we cut to the train arriving and white for arriving, which is Kurt, of course Kurt Russell. From that cut, the train station, however, was very small and the line of the train, the, li the railway line, is a very short. It's like if it goes past the camera a little bit and then that's it. So I had to play with very little space for the train. And here's Kurt with his real moustache and his real white earth look. I think he played it magnificently. And there's this little incident with a horse and the boy, and it shows that he doesn't want anybody to hump horses. Or it, it shows right away that he's a man who has humanity in him. It hurts, don't it? Now let go of that stud. Go on about your business. <laughs> By the way, Kurt's son is called White. He always liked to play White Herb, so he called his son White. So, so that would be, that's interesting. Mr. Herb. You see the water tower? It says Tucson. I sell Tucson with the water tower, so I don't have to put a title. It says Tucson, Arizona, now you know. And we try to make it as busy as possible in the railway station with Chinese, if you look at the back, because they were working with Chinese in the railway lines, etc. Ah, I see. Easy on the green. Strike it rich. There you go. Well, all right, that's fine. Tell you one thing, though. And in this scene, we establish the meeting with all the brothers and how they go back to make a new life in Tombstone. And here he is, and here is his brother, Sam Elliott and Bill Paxton, playing the two brothers, the two are brothers. I go through, I like to do the show, I went through the Morse code, uh, the telegraph office. Hey boy. <laughs> and show them then the wives. And even with this dialogue, you, you feel more or less what, who the characters are. Louisa. Oh, you're so lovely, darling. I'm at your feet, just at your feet. I guess it's only right. Ma always said Morse the prettiest. Yeah, but she doted on the frowner. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Maddie, Maddie, they're already here. Folks, this is and you feel the nervousness of uh, nice White's wife, who well, is really on drugs, on laudanum, the drugs of the period. I sure been so about this. you see that she's nervous and she stammers, and then they all look in the mirror of that telegraph office, and they become like a photograph of the whole family with a train in the background. Actually, the movie shows what happens to that family, how it gets destroyed, how they get, some of them get killed, how them get ruined. Gracious. We could be sisters. Mighty fine. I wonder where he found her. Same place we found her, probably. <laughs> and here you see drugged up uh, Matty, who, uh, yes, I did. Yes. who I asks the other one to give her some laudanum, which was like a drug of the period. Just be careful now. It's full of hop. Oh, don't worry, I just get headaches sometimes. Hey, Virg, see anything a doc while you're at Preston? I like that little touch with Bill Paxton eating his apple and then throwing it, and it was his idea, actually. I like actors who are inventive and do little things, add to the, he throws the apple. And then we cut to this scene, we cut to a lot of money, a watch, and then the fingers playing the coin. And then I, with that, I go up and I establish Val Kilmer, who plays Doc Holliday. 
Five hundred. Must be a... We shot that in the old Tucson studios in one of the saloons. Frank Stallone plays the other guy playing cards with him. And this is Joanna Pakula playing his girlfriend, Kate. The famous Kate, actually. She was famous in the West. I had a wonderful cameraman in this movie, William Fraker. He did a great job here with the smoky room, you see. And uh, well, I was building all the time tension with Val and showing his character. Cover your ears, darling. <coughs> Isn't that a daisy? I like to show a bit the room sometimes, not only close up, show that where we are, get the feel, the atmosphere of the place. Here's Frank Stallone. You see the naked woman behind him and he stands there and look at him, he's tapping the pistol with his fingers. To make the guy nervous. It's little details like that. So we tried to do it as authentic as possible. That was the secret word. As authentic as we could make it, based on facts, based on real photographs of the period. I just don't think I could bear it. Look how fast he brings his guns out. You know how long he practiced for that, Val? A long time. Just to pull those guns so fast out. Now we can be friends again. Touch that gun, I'll burn you down. Here's Joanna taking the money. And that's what they used to do. They used to play cards, and if somebody messed around with them, they'd take their winnings and go. By the way, Doc Holliday was really a dentist. From the south, and he was from a very aristocratic family. And if you notice, Val Kilmer speaks southern, but with an aristocratic kind of accent to show his level of where he comes from. Very, very subtle. And Joanna Pakula plays Kate, who was of Hungarian extraction, so that explains her accent. And here they are in the morning, you see a guy sweeping the street to give you the feeling that it's early morning. This scene went longer. They went. They went up on the horses and then they rode away and it was a beautiful shot, but we had to cut because of time. I, I, I like to use in the movies what I call candy floss shots, like sunsets and show the grandeur of the West here, using different lenses. This is a very long lens to heat. And here they are arriving to go, going towards Tombstone. This is outside Tucson, you can see. And they're all, if you notice, all the clothes are dusty because when you ride on a horse, you're not pristine. You have dust on yourself and <laughs> you get cramps coming off a horse, which you see Kurt Russell comes out and he moves his body because... If you look, here lies Lester Moore. There's a nice saying there. And here we come into Tombstone, which was like the Paris of the period in California. In, in Arizona, I mean, California. I'm in California right now. So with, you see glimpses of the town, you see, of Tombstone, and trying to get the feeling that there was all kinds of people, Mexicans, Chinese. Uh, there's a woman there advertising the photography shop with all the photographs pinned on her dress. This is the girls of the nightclub, so if you can call it that. Here we go, ladies. Birdcage Theater, you see the Grand Hotel here. That's where you're gonna stay for the time being. You establish the chef, so everything is done simultaneously, like killing, as they say, two birds with one stone. Here is uh, Kurt stretching. Have you ever seen a movie of a Western guy stretching when he gets off the horse? They have to stretch they, because they're full of dust. Name's John Behan, Cochise County Sheriff. He's this still is town, moving himself. Just this minute, I'm Wyatt Earp, and these are my brothers, Wyatt Earp and Morgan. Dodge City. Yeah, they're all. Oh, they're all feeling tired from a long journey. Going into business, huh? Well then. He's a good actor, John Tenney. Side sheriff, I'm also tax collector. The sheriff. Sheriff. Uh, the sheriff comes and you know that he has a great reputation. He says, hello, and all that, like he knows who he is. 
Woods. Hey, you folks got a place to stay in? No. Nope. Like I said, we just got here. Well, I also sit on the town lot commission. Really? As a matter of fact, we got three lovely cottages coming up for rent. I'm throwing a good clean. No charge. Believe me, Mr. Hurt, you're not going to find a better deal within town limits. I don't know. Sounds pretty good. Well, I'll have my man show him to you. Here's a wide shot of the town, as much as wide as we can do it to show. Also, what I did, I joined two uh, locations together to make the town look bigger. Not the o usual one street town. So I used some in, in a place called uh, outside there is uh, Tucson and another place is old Tucson Studios. So I joined the two together to make the town look larger, instead of having one street all the time. He's a wonderful actor from the past, Harry Curry Jr. He's the godson of John Ford, the great John Ford. I had, he had to be in the movie, and he describes the town. He's another lawman here. All up and down Allen Street here. 24 hours a day, you got liquor, hostesses, gambling, making money hand over fist. All except the Oriental. Then we see the famous the Oriental. Even the high rollers won't go near it. The bar. That's too bad, too. It's a nice place. Hell of a way. The cowboys run this town, or try to run this town. There you As go. you can see, they had weak, low people there. Oh, what? And all they want to do, the herbs, they want to retire now. They don't want to go and do killings and shootings. So he walks in the Oriental. This is one of the best photographed scenes in the movie. I love the way it looks with the sunlight coming outside. And White Earp goes in to check, to get a cigar and all that. And and we have Billy Bob Thornton, who came as a favor to do a small scene. And it was like he didn't have to say much, so I told him, invent whatever you want, just be a bully. Yes, sure. And he really... Hey, the bully, you know. Excuse me for asking, no, nope, but kind of dead in here, isn't it? You don't listen to good things. They're playing Farrow there, which is a game of the West. At some places they still play it. It's, uh, it's like a kind of a poker game of the period. He was barging in here one day, slapping all the customers, waving his gun around. He takes out all the high class play. The only trade comes in and now is just the bummers and the drovers. Just the drinks. Yeah, White sees an opportunity here just to get in and maybe buy the place up since he has money from Dodge where he used to be. He was famous in Dodge too, White. And God damn it, Junior, how many times am I going to have to tell you to keep that damn cigar out of my face? Huh? White only had killed one man by then. He didn't do anything. It was, he never used a gun to shoot people. He just hit them on the head with, his, with the handle of the gun. He didn't believe in violence, really. And here's Billy Bob. Bullying everybody. Is that a fact? You like the yellow yeah. flowers there at the back. It gives it a nice color combination with everything else. With the daylight outside, people walking. I like the, the, all these levels of movement. That's a fact. I'm real scared. Damn right you're scared. I can see that in your eyes. Here it shows that the white therapist is more of a psychological guy than a pistolero or a gunman. He uses all the psychology to, to intimidate. Listen, mister, I'm, I'm getting awful tired of your... <laughs> I'm getting tired of your gas. Now jerk that pistol and go to work. <clears throat> I said throw down, boy. You see how nice the yellow behind him, the glow of yellow gives it... Uh, I looked for the picture. You gonna do something or just stand there and the beautiful look at the contrast of the yellow behind. I love combinations of colors mm -hmm. like that. I didn't think so. Of course he wasn't smacking him there, just keep sick. The old Hollywood trick. Hang it over the bar. But his face is all right for some reason. <laughs> just going back. Ever. Oh, what do you say, Milt? Twenty-five percent of the house takes sound about right. You know, the movie wasn't a very expensive movie, so to make, so we had very, we had limited amount of money. So I, this is the only cattle drive I had. A few cows going there because every time I used the cows, we had to pay. So, <laughs> this was one chance to show the cows and show some movement in the street. All we gotta do is keep our eyes on that brass ring, fellas. You're the one, why? 
Well, Johnny Tyler. And it shows also that it's a frontier town. Also uh, painted the whole town, if you notice, has interesting colors, the walls of the buildings and everything. If you notice, it's not the usual brownish, you know, wood. Because it was going up, this town. It was like going up in lifestyle. I am rolling. And here's Val Kilmer. He appears as Doc Holliday again in this town. And then there's Billy Bob standing there with a gun. Going into business for ourselves, Doc. Well, I just got us Faro game. Oh, since when is Faro a business? Don't you always say that gambling's an honest trade? No, I said poker's an honest trade. Only suckers buck the time. And what I like that he does here, when uh, Doc Holliday tells him to go away, he puts the gun down and he's so intimidated he says thank you. Which wraps up the whole thing, you know. Johnny, I apologize. I forgot you were there. You may go now. Just leave that shotgun. Leave it. Thank you. Sheriff Behan. Where's John Tiny? Sheriff. Have you met Doc Holliday? Kiss on you, wife. It was very hot. It was about 120 degrees here, more even, in Tucson. And even very hot nights, like 99, 190 nights. So there was no, no help in weather. But it was beautiful and sunny, and that was good for shooting. And uh, we also had some lightning storms, which we used to the nth degree. Look at the building in the far end there. there were, we tried to build new buildings or show that there were new buildings being done. I put up tents, you see later, construction to show that the town is being built still. You never, you very rarely you see that the town is still built up. It's a, quite a long scene, all done in the middle of the streets of Tucson and uh, just talking and establishing everything we would like to know. What do you say, old friend? Also, I think that the, this film, as you will see as it progresses, is the love between two men, two strong men, between White Earp and Doc Holliday. It's the bond of these two men. That was what the most interesting thing in this movie for me. It shows how they go through all kinds of dangers and all kinds of hazards, and they stick together. And they're like in loyalty and friendship. Law and order every time. That's us. And here's the stagecoach arriving, and uh, they're all running to up uh, to help the stage. I wish I'd, I'd dressed this guy better. The guy on the right with a gun. He's a bit too clean. It always bugged me after I finished the movie, but it was too late. You see here, I have the umbrella opening, and you just see the shadow of her head under the umbrella. Her, the silhouette. That's scenery. And then, quickly with cuts, you establish that White Earp falls for this girl. She looks at him. Doc Holliday understands what's going on. So the whole thing is all tied together. I wonder who that tall drink of water is. My dear, you have such a gaze upon the quintessential frontier type. Note, the lean silhouette, eyes closed by the sun, they're sharp as a hawk. He's got the look of both predator and prey. I want one. Happy hunting. <laughs> We come down now from the night. Uh, I like that it goes from black, which is night, to the theater, the Birdcage Theater. And I like also the photography here, the lighting of Bert Raker. It's beautiful. And it shows the rowdy bunch, how these guys controlled everything and they drank, and the, which is really what happened in many places in those days. And uh, how they mistreat the deputy here. And I use the crane to go up to the balconies and see the brothers there all together. This is so much fun. We haven't been to a show since years. I hope they're good. And then White and his wife come in and he helps her. And Doc, the two friends together <laughs> with Kate and Maddie. So it's like little vignettes of life. 
this group, then the other, the rest of the brothers, and then down, down at the pits are the, are the gangs and the rowdy guys. I was wondering if you might... Prayer. Nice meeting you. Uh, if you notice the, the, the tent, the fire tent, the, the, the fire curtain is uh, interesting. What is it? And you see all this, the candles lighting the stage. You can see the smoke, which is reality. Professor Gilman. It's limestone. Catch stuff. Hey, Professor. It was very hot in there, so the fanning is real. <laughs> it's not, nobody's acting there. I think uh, a lot of... Uh, Research is important in a movie of a period, so you get to know every little detail, the candles, the chandeliers, how they were, how they light that stage, the effects. If you see at the back later, you'll see that he uses glass, a bottle of glass color on the light to change the effects, like filters, so to speak. And that's what we tried to do. It was all on photographs, on documentation, try to make it as accurate as possible. I'll say that. What do you think, Billy Nilly? All the clothes were washed and rewashed and pre-washed, so they give them the feeling that they're worn and they don't come, as I said before, from a shop window. And I think it's all a contrast. You have the wealthier people on the top, you have the rowdy cowboys at the pit, with their guns and they're like all getting drunk and this guy's reciting Shakespeare and Faust and I mean it's like here's Faust or the devils you know it's very appropriate about those guys in the pit now what in the hell is this well, that, that's Faust he's gonna make a deal with the devil this piece was very long and I had to cut it because it went on and on, this Faust thing, you know, and uh, all we had to do is establish different people and establish that here's the bottle with the facts and establish that he sees her again and he gets attracted to her white earth and, and establish all those people in the pits there, uh, all the cowboys and build them up, their character. He talks about the devil here. I already did it. <laughs> it also established how much drinking was done by Doc Holiday. Here they are, applauding. Mm. But who is the devil? And then she comes and pulls the mask and it's her. So, uh, and then he sees her behind the mask. And that's the, and how the wife feels that something is wrong, she gets suspicious. Matty, or. You may indeed. And of yes. course, Doc Holliday is his conscience. And look at the wife, how disturbed she gets. A little detail like that. And then they come out and they talk about life and death, and Bill Paxton was talking about seeing the light and the stars. This was a much longer scene, but it went on and on and on. And Why? Do you believe in God? No, come on, really, do you? Yeah, maybe. Hell, I don't know. Well, what do you think happens when you die? That's another thing. It shows that uh, there was spirituality in those days. There was spirituality always, actually, in all, in all, in all uh, history, through the legends of King Arthur and Camelot, and there was always spirituality. And it's also very interesting that he should talk about it. Uh, Bill Paxton is one of the herbs because afterwards he gets shot, as we know, and uh, it's interesting that he says he cannot see the light that he talks about. Here again you see a bit of a conflict between Herb and his wife. Look how nervous she plays her. Like irritable and... I think she did a good job there. Really, I could stay a while. Is that the bottle Lou gave you? Yes, it is. Maybe you should see a doctor. <gasps> Why, it's just headaches. I know what I'm doing. No, I don't need to see a doctor. Just go. And as you can see here, they're all brutally honest with each other. There's no vagueness or anything like that. They just say exactly what, how they feel about it. And you can see it in this scene. Thank you. 
Night, man. We had so many scorpions on the ground walking around while we were shooting this because all the lights at night in the desert bring all those little insects and bugs. We cut back to the bar, the movement, the commotion. He's running now the bar, White Herb and his brother, and Doc Holly is looking on. Everybody's betting. I got some deeds here. I'll take seven stinking diamonds. Let's go. A lot of money. You can't stand the heat, pal. Get out of the You're kitchen. the doctor. <laughs> Sad news. Man. You lose. So now we're in. So the now they own it. The property. I can. call this one the Maddie Blaylock. Maddie will get a kick out of that. It's her maiden name. And what a maiden, pure as the driven snow, I'm sure. Hey, Doc, come on now. It's just his style, more. It doesn't mean anything. Tell me something, my friend. I'm curious. Do you actually consider yourself a married man, forsaking all others? Oh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I was no angel when we met. Neither was she. People can change, Doc. Sooner or later, you gotta grow up. I see. <clears throat> and what would you do if she walked in here? She. And again, back to back, he sees her again, you know? So you're establishing this romance building without words. And the doc is the witness, he's teasing him and he's seeing what's happening. Even more than White knows, he hasn't realized maybe yet that he's falling for this girl. Here she is again, coming into like a great diva from the opera. Everybody wants to dance with her. And of course, from dance to dance to dance, she ends up in front of him. And now you see somebody else is attracted to her. Allow me the pleasure of a drink. Milk, champagne! This duck holiday making fun of him. I stand corrected, Wyatt. You're an oak. Thanks, Kate. So now they all... Oh, here's Billy Zane, who plays her friend, her companion in, uh, in the, all the shows they did together. You know, they were doing, like, there were shows they were going from town to town, so... And here the cowboys are... Oh, he says... He, he wanted to sign an autograph. He says, can you do this for... My wife won't believe it. I met you. It was like... Uh, like a star today. And then the, the cowboys come in and grab the paper which he signed. The autograph, let's say. And he starts the conflict with the cowboys. I'm retired. With Ike Clanton. The actor told me that he was most of the time drunk playing that part. He, I didn't realize it until after he told me. the first time, winner to the king, $500. Shut up, Ike. <laughs> you must be Doc Holliday. So here starts the conflict in Latin between Ringo and Doc Holliday. Tired too? Not me. I'm in my prime. Yeah, you look it. Curly Bill with a red shirt. You watching. Ringo. Look, darling. Johnny Ringo. The deadliest pistol they have since Wild Bill, they say. What do you think, darling? Should I hate him? You don't even know him. No, that's true, but... White watching, and then we go under the table, and he has a gun ready, so he's no fool. And here's the... Reminds me of... Sheriff coming in. Me? No. I hope you learn some Latin from this movie. <laughs> it will help in some way. And vino veritas. Ajik Wadajis. Harry Curry. What a lovely man, Harry Carey. He told me so many stories about John Ford. And, and his father was Harry Carey, the Western star in the practically silent era. And, and jo Duke Wayne. He knew so many stories. It was a fun just to listen to him. He also wrote a book recently about his life. It was called In the Company of Heroes. Now I really hate him. What's it, Johnny? I hear he's real fast. Michael Bin had to practice a lot with his gun because it's really difficult to do that. It looks easy, but it's very difficult because the gun is heavy and he has to turn. Look how he's turning it. So he really had to practice a lot. 
And even Doc had to practice with that a little. At the end of the movie, he sent me one of those cups for as a gift. And he says to George from Doc, you know. So I understood right away. <laughs> One thing about this film, which I find was wonderful, was that all the actors were like, there was a brotherhood. They were, we were all worked together at the common cause. Even on a Sundays, we would go and do rehearsals. Our only day off was a Sunday, and we'd go and do rehearsals. <laughs> and then we had like one hour of fun, which was to shoot milk bottles in the air for practice. <laughs> It was a difficult task to keep all those guys and ladies, you know, moving at the right speed. But uh, they all knew what they were doing, and they all loved that they were in something interesting and something powerful. Getting kind of spooky around here. But they all worked together. We sat at night by a pool there in the hotel in the middle of 100 degrees and tried to do some changes in the script or talk about scenes. So we're all working continuously, all about this movie. Peace out, sir. Very impressive. And of course, I'm, I'm open-minded. When an actor has to bring something to the part, I always listen because he may have some great ideas, you know? So we work like a team, and, and Kurt helped a lot, too, and Val, and all the actors, really. This location is... Uh, up uh, on the top of uh, Tucson, there's a mountain and it has a great green location. I thought I'd put some green in the movie. The movie was too dry. And as a contrast for the attraction scene, let's go it. I went up to this forest, which is in, on a mountain in the middle of Tucson. And I played that scene. I'm just. Everybody knows. And uh, here, it was very difficult to get up to this top of this. You know, it was very difficult to bring the horses here, but we did finally to get the view and all that. Easy now. Kurt is a wonderful horseman, of course. He does everything. He's good at everything. But this shot with her riding, uh, she's a double, you know. Well, I guess we'd better split them up. It's been real. I have a better idea. Let's run it out of them. So I tried to use some of the locations through the riding, you know, until they come to the top of the hill and then continue. It's kind of flirting riding with each one with his own horse and kind of flirting. Even the horses are kind of flirting with each other. You'll see later even. And then this was a steep hill down, and uh, again, we used uh, doubles for that. Good horsemen. And then we came here in this valley here, and it was full of uh, <laughs> bullshit, you know. So we had to put all those flowers all around, and, and I, to create a more beautiful atmosphere, you know. I mean, it was, we arrived there, there was, the trees had shed, it was terrible. We tried to jazz up the scene by putting flowers in the background and planting them or whatever. And then we, I, I used the pollen, like pollen, and we just shed it through the scene. You could see pollen moving, flower pollen. And suddenly this cow field became a place where they could meet. Yeah, I... That was tough, I must say, because we wondered there was some rains. I don't know. And our whole area was kind of yucky. So when I came in the morning, we just rushed and tried to save it here. You see the, all those red flowers? We put them strategically. And, and now and then you may see some pollen falling from the... I don't know if you can see it as much as on the... Let's see. We had more pollen. Maybe it was the first shot. What do you want out of life? Jeez. <laughs> do you get these questions? Just answer. Well, I don't know. Make some money, I guess. Maybe. Here's the poll, and you could see it. some children. I... Doesn't suit you. Well, how would you know? It just doesn't, that's all. Well, I ought to know my own mind, and I'm telling you what suits me is a family and kids. 
Suits me right down to the ground. In fact, that's my idea, Heaven. All right, what's your idea, Heaven? Room service. <laughs> He's laughing again. But that's what I want. The thing here, this scene went longer. And in this scene, they kissed in the original. And we thought that it was not a good idea that they kissed, that leave it open, you see that something happens, but you don't show it on the screen. It's much more powerful. And that's what we did. We just ended it in the looks, and you see that the love is building. But, and then it's up to you to imagine what happened. But with a kiss, it became a bit, I don't know. I didn't like it. Where you talk? Never had a woman talk like that? Never. I don't have time to be proper. I want to live. I'm a woman. I like men. If that means I'm not ladylike, then I guess... And also, it was like too obvious, I would say. You're different. So it's just the looks and everything, and then you cut to him arriving in town or whatever is the next cut. I'll take my oath on it. The good thing about this town in Tucson that we were shooting is that it faced west one of the parts of the street, one side of the street. So you get the shots of the sunset, which are very brief, by the way. You have to really hurry to put the camera because they disappear. They call as you to movie people, it's called magic moments. Is that the opium Lou gave you? A new bottle, isn't it? Go easy. I like this golden glow. It's a filter that gives this golden glow to the scene. I don't know if you notice it. I hope you do. And he comes in and he's quiet and you know that something is wrong. He feels guilty. How you feeling, Maddie? And she's under the influence of this laudanum, this drug. I don't know. Uh, I'm all right. I'm fine. <laughs> This location is a real uh, sure. building in the, in one of the towns we were, and we just uh, the designed the interior. We set dressed it. What if we pulled out stakes and just moved on, you know? And we could stay on the move, just keep going, see the world, just live on room service. And then here he repeats again, let's go and have room service. And she says, what, huh? She's somewhere else, and he's somewhere else. He's thinking about the girl, he, and he wants to be with her, but she's not letting him here. Nothing. I'm just, just thinking out loud, you know. I, nothing. She doesn't understand. Then you see, he goes back. Forget about it. I keep the focus on him and then on her. And then I move to him, and you see how he's suffering. And you know that the marriage is over. This was one room, and we put an arch and made it like a double room with a billiard room and the other one to enlarge this room. And here is, uh, by the way, Val, who practiced a lot on the piano and who's a good piano player, playing the piano himself, for real. Hey! So you see, folks, here we have everybody does things for real. I mean, we have real lightning, real mustaches, real clothes. I mean, nothing is fake. We're not doing a sci-fi movie. This is all research and tender care, as we call it. Camp Town races. Steven Stinking Foster. Oh, uh, yes, well, this happens to be a knockdown. Which? You know, Frederick fucking Chopin. <laughs> Here's the tent of the opium. You know, they had this opium tents in the middle of the town in those days. And he comes after smoking the opium and he's all high. He comes out of the tent crazed. Powers is very good here. Powers booth. Oh, I feel great. And he wants to shoot at the moon, he says, you know. Just. When I read the script, uh, the whole movie becomes story in my mind, and I, I have the whole movie in my head, visually, except for very few things, sometimes not. So I had to go up and up and up and up, 
to show that he's... Uh... And then the camera had it going back down towards him again until he came close to the guns, but that was cut. So you don't get that here. It was like a double crane shot. Why don't you just leave it alone? No, I, uh... I gotta do something. There's your down card. Look at that, he's shooting at the moon. This was all one shot before, you see? And now it was intercut with the interior. Curly Bill! <laughs> Come on now. Well, howdy, Fred. Hand those over, Curly. It was very difficult to have uh, Harry Curry fall on the ground because, you know, he's, he's not a spring chicken, but uh, he did very well, I must say. Wonderful man, and a very wonderful man, actually, very helpful. And here, this is the ultimate of evil. He shoots him. You see the smoke coming out of his jacket? I wanted the smoke to come out of it because everything smoked, you know? from the bullets. You never see it very often, this. You just see blood, which usually you don't see blood. The blood comes later. And then he falls on the ground. And then you have the whole town. We lit this with what they call the moon. It's a big, big light. Encircled by cloth, very light linen. And you pull it up with cords in the middle of the town. So it lights the whole town, like a moon, but it's lights. That's why we got all the scorpions and the snakes and everything coming around. Because that strong, very strong light brought everything together in the middle of the town here. Oh, I'm not. And uh, that's what Billy did. That's how it's lit. You see how it's lit? It's this big moon on top. Step aside, we'll tear you apart. Artificial moon, of course. And then he... He lights other little things, like a little door here, a lamp here, just to give it more detail. You're not as stupid as you look, Ike. And here's Ike Clanton. Go on, I'll get back. Go on! Billy! Stephen Lang plays him. He's a wonderful actor. And you, music lover. You're next. <laughs> drunk piano player. You're so drunk, you can't hit nothing. I like this line when he tells him You're probably seeing the something. two of you. I have two guns, one for each of you. He doesn't get as much laugh as I thought it would. But you know, you never know. You make a movie, and places you don't think they would laugh, they do, and others, you know, very hard. So this was, if you notice, this is quite a difficult scene because there's a lot of things happening and a lot of movement in the scene. Well, as you can see, never a dull moment. I think music is very important in movies, but I don't think too much music is good either because it can pull you away from reality. Here's another one of the candy floss shots, which shows dawn or dusk it's dawn actually we shot it at dusk <laughs> and this is that so it's a cut that shows that time has passed and then the billiard size of the bar I said no by the time I got there Marshal White had already been shot that scene was again much longer and it built much longer the bond of the brothers but again unfortunately because of length I had to cut who cares none of my business anyway here you go, Milk. Gotta love this game. You know, boys, when we're finally set. Without the phony beams, you know, they usually put beams like as if there was this. Beams are created by dust, so if you don't have dust, you can't make this beams. And uh, there's my idea to put all those uh, uh, stuffed uh, birds on the wall to give an idea that these guys were hunters and, you know, you know in, in that time of their lives, you know. You see all the birds up on the wall in the background? 
Instead of having another picture of a painted of a naked woman, I thought that would be nice to show some birds in flight. And of course, this is the table, the billiard table, the pool table where Bill Paxton gets killed and he falls on it and put him on it. Which again, I thought was a very interesting idea that he would be lying on a pool table. I'm busy. We're all busy. Sorry, I'm there, but you're I right. find that this scene could have still been, been better, but because of the cuts, that's good, that's good. I had to jump whole things of dialogue here, so it's a bit dodgy, in my opinion. And the scene how Sam Elliott gets the idea to get out is very short. His thinking there to make a decision is very short to become a marshal, you know? That's too short. I didn't have enough because I had to cut for length. Here it shows that again, these guys are terrorizing the town and he grabs a little boy. And this was not all on the script. I invented this because I wanted to show the terror they created in the town and how, and then he has just a second, a relationship with the mother of this who has just a scar on her face. Little detail of this woman who has been abused or something happened to her and he saves her, her child from the, and she looks like she's a cool school teacher. She's taking all these children back. There were four brothers actually, by the way, but we don't show the fourth brother in this movie, the fourth herb. If you look at the movie called uh, My Darling Clementine, the show, The Fourth Earth, who dies earlier. Um, the John Ford, like, which was not based on fact, like this movie. Beautiful movie, but it was not based on actual, you know, incidents here. Here he comes back, and they're ready to revolt here. No, we don't have to talk. You can read, can't you? I tried to do everything with one camera movement, bring him in, show the people, bring him down, meet with the brothers, go into the marshal's office. And then here I used the, what I call a split diopter, which the foreground and the background are always in focus. And you'll see it more in the close-ups. Uh, it's got to have some law and order. These birds don't do this to me. It's got nothing to do with you, Wyatt. It's got to do, it. to do with me. I'm your brother, for Christ's sake. God, I don't believe this. Talk to him, will you, or hit him? Ah, oh, God, don't tell me. Like you said, Wyatt, we're brothers. Got to back your brother's play. Just did like I figured you would. All right, now you listen to me. Oh, come here. First time in our lives we got a chance to stop wandering and finally be a family. Now this is trouble we don't need. You saw what happened to Fred White? We know what we're doing, Wyatt. Okay, fine. Say you're right. Say you don't get yourself killed. That's something else. All those years I worked those cow towns, I was only ever mixed up in one shooting. Just one. But a man. White always in control in the face of danger. You see I'm Bill Paxton, he's playing it here very nicely. Boy, you don't ever want to know. Quiet. Not ever. And Sam, here's a split out there, you see? Focus in the foreground, focus at the back. Didn't you make a dent, did I? All right. So now the two brothers become marshals and white leaves. Then we cut to a, another magic hour shot, a little bit darker, of her singing Red River Valley, one of my favorite songs of the period. And she's in the where herbs bar actually and then you see the guys playing cards the good guys and the bad guys actually in the card game and then he walks in i like the shot when he walks in and he sees her again he walks in with his long black coat which are great and the girl we used a lot of props and detailed thing? props of the period to give the to help more with the atmosphere and uh, whatever we could do to give it more authenticity. Clan and the McClary brothers came in an hour ago. I tried to get him to go to bed, but he won't let go. 
It's, uh, I find it more fun to work with a lot of good actors than one actor in a movie. Each one has different difficulties, but working with the whole group is like being a brotherhood, you know? With one actor has other advantages, of course. I always think that the emotion is the most important thing in a movie, the emotion. If you care about your people, you have a movie. And then it's everything else is a mosaic that's put together to form a big picture. It's all these links. If one link breaks, the whole thing falls apart. So everything has to be right at the same time. You have to have the right costumes, the right production design, the right sound, the right music, the right actors, and the right locations. Because a location in a movie can change the look. It's what you keep seeing behind you, all the, behind on the screen, behind the actors. So that's very important. And also sounds, little sounds can mean so much in a scene. And, uh, you know, the twirling of the gun, the twirling of the cup, the barrel. Why, Ike? Whatever do you All mean? those little things, the tapping when he's tapping on the, on the handle of the gun in the beginning, Val, Val Kilmer. Little things can make a big difference. I know. And that's my main thing. My main thing is if it's a real story, which is like this one, I want to do as much research as possible and try to give it chocolate full of nuts. It should be the whole scene. Goddamn And when you have Panavision, Panamorphic, you have so much space that you can show things simultaneously. Get your hands off me! Don't you ever put your hands on me, see? Don't you ever try to manhandle a cow? Because we'll cut you Sometimes the scene doesn't need any sound. It could be a quiet moment. Sometimes it needs sound. And, uh... There was a movie they did once called The Fifth that's no dialogue at all with Ray Land in the old days. There was no dialogue because it wasn't needed. And now then the Japan a movie called Island by the Japanese, Kaneto Shindo, there was no dialogue because it wasn't needed. So sometimes dialogue is important as a, to help you with the story. Sometimes it's not. You don't need it. I think movies is a visual media. Although this movie has dialogue, it has dialogue that pertains to the story and to the emotion and to the, what's happening in the picture. You build the emotion. You know, here it starts to, for the first time you see Val Kilmer, he cannot take it, he's coughing, he got irritated with the other guy, the Clanton, and he starts spitting blood. This is the beginning of the, of the, of the end, really. So, so what you do is you weave all these things together to make them work, you know. The most difficult for an actor or for a director is, since we're shooting a movie out of context, is to know when do you show this and how do you show a progression of things. And another thing, with a movie like Tombstone, it was uh, huge, the movie. We only shot it in 62 days, which is in that heat with all those people. And moving horses, I, trust me, it's not like moving a bicycle in your back. I mean, it's like a big deal. <laughs> Pick these guns up. Come on. This scene was cut in an original uh, picture because it was the move was too long, they thought, and we needed it shorter. But this is a very important scene because it shows the relationship between White Earp and his wife, her addiction, and it shows that he tries to be with her, even if he is attracted to the other woman. And it shows his conflict. So I thought it was a very important scene to be seen in the movie. And it also, in a Western, it's always wonderful to show more human relationship between families. Usually the Westerns don't have as much of that. This you admit. I think Kurt is wonderful here, showing his conflict, the way it starts building from washing to finding the bottles. I know. And, uh, and also, she's doing very well with the scene, which was very difficult for her. But I think she did a good job. For me, Wyatt, and I get so cold. What's between you and that woman? This is the the first time that she confronts him about the other woman in the movie. And in the original shooting, I had a love scene between. But with, between White Earp and, and the other lady, let's say. Uh, but I cut it because I wanted to be, not to be consumed the love story so fast. Just leave me alone. 
So we shot in, but we had a, a cooperation between the actors. We had, we were all in the same stagecoach, let's put it. Look at little detail, like he pulls his jacket to show the gun, so he's ready. This is a detail that's important. Because when the bad guys come out of the cell, he should be ready. He should be prepared, being a marshal. And in a film like this, which is full of little subplots of all these relationships, to juggle them is the, the most difficult thing, to juggle them at the right pace, at the right time. Every little shot, I think, counts. And, you know, you can direct the scene in many ways, but only one way is really the best way. There could be good ways, but one is the best way. Here again, he uses the gun, white, to the hand of the gun to get rid of him. And this is like the beginning of what, of the end of the OK Corral. You're going to bleed. You got a fight coming. It's coming today. I still remember the song from OK Corral sang by. I was a kid then, you know. It's coming! Oh, here's a great shot. This is a split diopter again. You see her face big here? And he's at the back in bed with a doctor. That's what I meant by split diopter. It gives a lot of depth in color. Usually color hasn't got the depth of black and white. Like in, like if you see a movie like Citizen Kane, you see the depth because the lenses were so. But in color, it's more difficult. And then I tracked with her, but this was cut again because of speed. It was a long track outside the balcony of the hotel, and she comes to the other side of the room where he kicks the doctor out. I shoot very few takes, but I shoot with different cameras, like two cameras always. And I always change the angles to give me more to do the shot with. So if I need a cut, I can go from one angle to the other. And I always like a fluid camera, I like the camera now to be able to move when it has to move with another camera still on somebody. Because a close-up can sometimes help the movie, but sometimes helps it indirectly. You can shorten the movie, and if you have problems, you can get away from. So I learned, like, uh, when Visconti does a movie, he does all those wonderful, elaborate shots. But if you want to show them in an American audience, you have to tighten them and make them move a bit. Because the American audience watches movies with a much faster pace than any European, in my opinion. You cannot do a very leisurely film here, because the TV has taught the American audience and the movies the fast moving, you know? But again, I don't think a movie has to be so fast anymore because the audience are fed up with that fast movement. They want to go back to the old days, to the nostalgia, to the... That's why some period movies are working now. Okay, here they are, they're ready to come. The bad guys are coming into the OK Corral and it's the beginning of the gunfight which incidentally was very short and very quick. It wasn't like a big battle. Yeah, this is like a bad dream. Stay calm, use your head, it'll be all right. Well, the history is like the one at the back of the okay, corral, and they just shot at each other in, in, in seconds. And that was the end. You see other movies, there's a big gunfight, a big gunfight that goes on and on and on, and it doesn't work like that. It was, so we choreographed it exactly as it happened the data and what I did is I took every actor's what he had to do and I put it under one column and I gave him the, the, the paper and I gave the other actor so each actor knew exactly what he wanted to do at the certain time of the scene like at, let's say for example at 12 o'clock 12 or 5 he had to do this the other guy at 12 you know and by putting them all together we went on a Sunday at our own time and we rehearsed the whole thing with all the numbers of each one, who came first, who came second, you come first, he came second, the other one moved third. So I can put the whole thing together, otherwise it would have fallen apart, to give it the speed and the movement that we needed to show everything, but to show it fast. And I even had problems because we blew up some windows in the photographer's shop and they didn't have any more extras. So in the film now, you see, when you see it at the end, it has no glass, the paint anymore. Because it, we took away everything and we just used it without glass because I ran out of glass. Because they were stupid and they brought me three panes of glass only. 
And with all that shooting, you know, three panes of glass is like nothing. So, but you have to quickly notice it to see it, you know. So the, the whole scene of the OK Corral builds with a meeting, builds with the bad guys passing by, the cowboys, builds with Doc joining the group. And it builds with a few things, you know. For example, I put a fire, a building catches fire. That's not in the script, it was no way. Why? Because I want them to walk by, and everybody's running to put out this fire, but they don't care, they don't have time for that. They have to meet at the OK Corral. They just look at it, if you notice, look, he looks at it. People are running, but they're disturbed about it, but they have no time, they have to go to there. And then the walk to the OK Corral was too long. I had a great shots of these people walking and shadows on the ground, you know, all kinds of angles. And then I discovered it made it look like it was the end of the movie. <laughs> so I used, because the shots were good, I said, hey, I have to use them. So I used them at the end, like a curtain call for the movie, from the scenes that I shot from the OK Corral. So when you see them at the end walking around the street, these are from this sequence here, as they're going to the OK Corral. And in this sequence, Val Kilmer says to me, do you think I should, maybe I should whistle, he says. I said, that's a great idea, whistle. So he's whistling. It worked, you know? Get ourselves into this. If you notice also, the boy comes and shoots at them with a toy. This was also invented, it wasn't there. Just to create a tension. The Bill Paxton gets like shot by this kid shooting at him. I mean, his nerves are so tight. And this is Fly's shop where he's taking a photo. He was the most famous photographer of the period. He's the only guy who had photographs of all these people in that period. And that's his saloon, his uh, Photoshop, and he was taking a photograph of uh, the future Mrs. Earp. <laughs> here it is, Army, throw and here hand. they are. There's a moment, they look. And all this is exactly detailed, except the cape falling on the ground, which, again, it was a good idea to make him throw the cape as he walks, it's like... But look at this detail here, look. Two guys run away because they're cowards. Behind them there's a whole Chinatown. I built a whole Chinatown to show there were other people, other, you know, mines. If you look in the distance, you'll see all this in the background. Bill Paxton plays the guy who's a little bit more nervous, you know? Oh my God. And then we had to find a reason how it starts this. And it started because one of them heard the click of a gun. You know the click? That's how it started. But to accentuate more, we thought that maybe Val could wink at him. And that added, uh, I mean, I don't know if that was reality, that's maybe the only little thing that's done. And then also I had a problem with the horse rearing up. Uh, I couldn't get this horse to rear, you know, that's a big problem. Here's the, you see the window breaking? If you look at the end, you see no more panes there, you know. And I shot this in uh, one, of the, one of the half days or something, the whole of the empire, yeah. It took three cameras I had here. So you see the Chinatown in the distance? And you see, I, 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 I made them to do a, like a trench for water, so it breaks a bit the ground. The ground was too white and ugly. So I had to build a trench and put some water to make the scene more interesting. <laughs> I think the, the OK Corral, that was in the script, but I think the OK Corral not happening at the end was a great idea because we want to know what's the aftermath of the OK Corral. The OK Corral was not the end of something, it was the beginning of something. And that's what I like about the script, was that it was the beginning. And you, if you notice, behind him is the newspaper, the famous newspaper of the, of the period, the building here behind the, the sheriff. You can see glimpses of a mining, you see the... Buildings being built, the oh mining God, rig, you know. Today be in.
I went to Tombstone, the town of Tombstone. I, I did research in the library there, and I met some people there. And you know, you slow, slowly put it together, and then you look at other movies of the of the thing, and you see they're all completely different. I mean, they look completely different from my grand, darling Clementine to uh, the, the Grandfather to Okay Corral to another film that they did with James Garner playing White. They, they all look completely different, and. Uh, the real truth, I mean, as far as we can make it, was in this film here. The real truth of the clothes they wore. If you look at the, the dark clothes, like they were undertakers kind of thing. Clothes that show the stature, in my opinion, made them more interesting. That's why some priests wear black, because it shows that they are different from you. And this is, again, a scene that shows the bond between them. And the film was, the scene here was going to end with the camera going up as if the little kid with the toy gun comes in the scene and he looks at the carnage and he just drops the gun and the camera moves to a backward, okay, corral, you know, that would bring up. But it, it's not there anymore. It's cut. I hope we find it someday. I like them. Don't you like the makeup of those people in the caskets? We made them like Rosa, like they used to be. And this scene was all shot at Magic Hour, which is, again, Magic Hour is just between sunset and sunset. <laughs> you cannot shoot two scenes of Magic Hour in different Magic Hours because they won't match. It's, people think that they can do it, but, but we did this like in one day, yeah. We're working very fast, actually, to finish it. Again, it shows the bond between the two brothers here. I almost wish I know more. I know, me too. This is a bell ringing of a church. That's another part of the town, and that's in Old Tucson Studios, where they shot great movies there, too. So, as I said before, I want to enlarge the town. And all this scene is shot with very long lenses across the street, from a long, long street. It's all shot with long lenses. I don't want to talk to you. Those men you killed were my friends. Every scene, you have to figure a different way of doing it to make it more interesting and give it more effect. Either it's the lenses or the photography or even elements, wind or rain or whatever. Here it has a bit of wind. And this has influenced me from the great directors of the past who I watched so many movies. John Ford, for example. Everybody praises John Ford for his westerns. But they forgot some of his greatest movies, which were non-westerns. Like uh, How Green Was My Valley, The Quiet Man, The Informer. I mean, I can go on and on and on about John Ford, non-westerns. And he still was great. And uh, David Lean, I think, is was one of my favorites because of his visual style. He had a great sense of the visual and the scope of how he can tell a smaller story in a big canvas. I think he's a great director because he had a great eye and he had a lot of culture in his mind. You could see all his movies have sang songs of the period and hymns and in a way he's also religious, I think. He's all obsessed with this religious feeling because you could see it through all his movies. The Informer is one, another one, How Green Was My Valley. And they all go back to uh, 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 to Ireland, really. Get off! Get off! Get off! And uh, and also he was very good in making brotherhood, a family unit. He always showed families. How a family worked, which is exactly what's happening here in Tombs. I'm not comparing myself with John Ford, God forbid, but here again we have a family unit, we have friendships, and we have the evils forces outside. God have mercy. Come on, Come Let's go get bullet, boy. Let's go get sauce. Baba. Yes, sir. Proceed, sir. Oh, here's the, the lightning striking and all that. Some critics said, oh boy, they really put a lot of phony lightning. But by the way, I want to inform you through this DVD that the, all the lightning is real. It's in Tucson, Arizona, and it is all real. Not now, I'm busy. It's the capital of lightning storms and thunder. And we had cameramen running all around, grabbing. I said, grab the shot, suddenly it happened. And which is also dangerous because you can get electrocuted, by the way. 
so you cannot shoot with electricity or anything. But all the stuff of the town and the lightning was real. And actually, you can see when it's real from the phony. Big one of those nights. And this is the scene with the little dog, this little... I always love animals in pictures, especially doggies and horses. <laughs> Now, this lightning outside, the lightning effects of the outside the bar are, are, are not real. But when you see the lightning in the camera, on the screen, it's real. Like this lightning effect here is not real. But when you see the really lightning here, this was real over the... And I like this little parlor scene. It looks very Victorian. <laughs> of all the ladies playing, playing tarot cards, really. More tea, Maddie? Mm -mm, no, no. Are you all right, Maddie? Yes. Are you expecting someone? Only Birch. I know it's awful to come here, but listen, I think something's going to happen tonight. And here it shows that there is no boundaries between, from the cowboys and the, they don't care if it's women or what. They, they try to kill anybody, and it's scary. Is the real lightning going on? And then you have this slight little scene of the, them eating at dinner late at night after the bar has closed with lightning outside and the little dog and then their brother comes all wounded up. I mentioned before John Ford, I also liked a very unsung hero called Henry King, a director that worked at Fox, which I think is one of the most underestimated directors in Hollywood. I don't want to talk about my contemporaries because it's better to talk about the other guys. Like the Frank Capras and the Frank Borzaghi's and John Huston's. Wilders and Wilers and Joe Stevens. Come on, Lou. What? What? He comes out too. Shot up his wife. His wife? Who ever heard of that? They're bugs, what? Don't let smart talk about living that live. There ain't no living that live with bugs. Why don't you listen to me now? We gotta get out of here. Get out of here. Listen to yourself, Wyatt. Uh, Lie down and crawl, you might get hurt. What kind of talk is that? Do you see? They're, they're sitting there, you don't know what happens to him, and then he comes in and he cries. It's always different ways of showing a scene. Because we have so much violence, sometimes it's better not to see it and get the result, but you hear it, hear it here. The most frightening thing is I have one hand to hold you with. That's more than enough to give you the, the, the motion. Don't worry, sister. I have one hand to hold you with. And that... Uh, and again, uh, uh, White Earp is getting more and more crazed at what's happening to his family. You see here, he's playing it very nervous, you know? His brother is going down, and and then like a few minutes later, his other brother will go down. And all this pressure piles up on him. Like he comes out here and I have wind to create the beginning of the turmoil. And when uh, the guy who wants to go back with them, one of the others wants to join him, he throws him the scarf. The scarf is moved by the wind. And then you can hear, feel that something happened to his brother. He drops the scar. He's right, Wyatt. You want us for anything? We're with you. made it like slow motion, like a little bit of slow motion, not slow motion and killing, just slow motion, like he feels it's his brother who got killed. He turns around and go to white dirt, you know. That's more important than the slow motion of the brother getting. And then he runs, he throws the scarf, here it is, and it moves in the wind there, he leaves it, 
I left the shot longer so I could see the scarf move, you know. And uh, and here he shows all the, the blood and gore. He's like holding the thing. The, the dog is barking. It creates this cacophony in the scene. And he's pulling the bullet out of him. This was prosthetic, by the way, this hole to pull the bullet. Everybody was against this, but I thought it would be more realistic to see the bullet coming out. You see the wife, how she's falling apart. Easy more. Is that better? You were right, Wyatt. They got me good. Don't let them get you, brother. You're the one. Easy more. Don't worry about that. Remember what I said about seeing a light when you're dying? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And here he comes again, uh, and, and, and Bill Pack says, the light is not there. Remember when he talked when he came out of the theater, he was, was to have a whole scene about the light, and now he's, he dies telling us that there is no hope, really. I hope there is a light. I would hope it. And then you start seeing how he cracks up and he becomes broken up. And you had seen that from the previous scene, how he slowly builds up with his other brother. And he kisses him and it becomes like, a, as I said before, like a Greek tragedy because one brother is dead. He's holding the blood, his blood in his hand. His wife rushes past him. He goes to his other, to his wife. She looks back, he shows her the hands of blood. And he's like drunk. With, with sadness and grief, and he walks backwards outside the room. And we follow him with a crane shot at the outside. And he's moving, and everybody's looking, and he knows the bad guys are somewhere in the shadows. And he's calling his name. He's calling his name. And then his future wife comes out. And he looks at her, and he says, leave me alone. He doesn't want any of the women now. It's all, he wants to stay with his grief. He looks around the other side. So all, the, all this is one shot. And he sees the other, the, the, re, the, the present wife. I'm getting confused with all the wives, guys. And then she looks at him sternly because the other woman looks at him. So there's all this jealousy going. And all he is in grief for his brother. And he cries his name. And you see it as you see it now. The camera doesn't go that high. So I, I lived with it. In this time when... White Earp really is, war uh, is crying over his brother's death. The audience is wa wondering, where is his friend, Doc Holliday? And that scene was cut again, and because of time. And what he's doing, he's drunk in his hotel room, reciting the Coleridge's Kublai Khan, which is all about the drugs and drinking and debauchery. We shot this scene. We're talking between Val, which what shall we use, Byron or uh, or Keats, or Coleridge or Keats, and then we ended up with Coleridge. But that scene was stolen. We had finished the day's work, and we, we tried to do that scene because both Val and myself thought that it was needed in the picture. It was never seen in the theatrical release, but now it's here for the first time. As you can see, the, f the film is divided in three parts. The first part is what happens in Tombstone at the beginning, up to the OK Corral. The second part is what happens after the OK Corral. And the third part is the revenge after all that. So it's like in three pieces. And it's really, I, and I personally don't think it's a violent movie. Some people said maybe it's violent. I don't think it's violent because I show violence, maybe because I show atmosphere and it creates more violence, the atmosphere without the violence. But it's really a historical piece. And whatever, we don't see any real blood of, uh, splashing all over like some other movie it's all done with i, I personally think with with great uh, uh, modesty let's put it this way i like the way valkyrie yeah. is wearing that cowboy hat like sideways and uh, makes him a bit uh, chic look completely destroyed now as he leaves with the coffins 
will. And all the bad guys can say, the cowboys, goodbye. Like the most awful thing, the way they say it. And so now he has to go back, he's disgraced. With his wounded brother, dead brother, a widow crying. And, he, and then everything, lightning starts to strike. <laughs> Act. Take still, Will. Finish it. This is another scene that was cut from the first feature film. Uh, because, again, because of space. But this scene shows the relationship again between Doc Holliday and Kate. And suddenly she disappears from the movie, but now we know what happens and how he leaves her. And I think, again, Val gives here a good performance, and, uh, and, and she's beautiful, too, so. Without a meal ticket. But, and I like his line, without a meal ticket, I suppose. So we put it in here. So I think it fits in the movie. You bastard. I'll move it now, darling. You bastard, son! Have you no time? What happened, we were cutting a lot of scenes out because we were over two hours and ten or something. And there was a ruthlessness that took place in the cutting. And, for example, I had to fight to keep the walk to the OK Corral was a bit too long. And uh, it was suggested that the walk was too long. It looked like the movie was finishing, which I agreed. But then I didn't know what to do with those shots. So I put them at the end as a final curtain with the actors walking with the final titles. So I preserved most of it anyway. But th th that place was not there. The film... Those, that, those walks, that long walk to the OK Corral was all shot like a much longer sequence. And of course I used those shots at the end of the movie as a final curtain, let's say. So w when I was a kid, the, the, the first movie I ever saw was a Bugs Bunny cartoon because I had to sleep early. So I went on a mat and I saw this Bugs Bunny. And I started seeing, my first feature was an old Roman epic Italian movie, of course, called Fabiola, which was like a Covadis version of Covadis in Italian. And then my first American movie when I was a kid was The Captain Blood. Michael Curtiz directed it. And my first love was swashbucklers and westerns. So through the years I've seen The Seahawk, Captain Blood, Robin Hood, Black Swan, with Tyrone Power, Suez with Tyrone Power, uh, Lloyds of London with Aaron Powell, Covadis with Robert Taylor, and on and on, all these spectacles. And of course, all those great westerns, Red River, High Noon, um, My Darling Clementine, Magnificent Seven, and all those wonderful westerns that, even the B westerns, like the Tall T, and, and there were all those Sam Peckinpah, Wild Bunch. On and on and on, I can name hundreds of them. Oh, Sergio, I knew Sergio. I also love Sergio Leone. I knew Sergio personally. He was a friend of mine when I lived in Italy. Lovely man, wonderful, full of a good heart. We have the same background. He was an assistant. He started as an assistant director, and I did. My first movie was a movie called Massacre in Rome with Richard Burton and Mastroianni, about a true story again of some horrible thing that the Nazis did in Rome during the Second World War. And it's a story about reprisals. So I like doing movies based on fact. And this is another one based on fact. So when you have a, a, a fact, it's more fun looking for, for info to do the movie. This, all the shots of the running shots and the killing shots were all done like stylistically with long lenses against the sun or, or heat bars in front of the camera with long lens to create movement. I think that the, like if we come from Europe, like I'm half Italian, I'm half Greek, you know, and, and I come from Europe. What we come here, we come here with a, with a cleaner mind, fresher point of view. Every detail is glows. Like in America, we go to Italy, it would be the same. 
If you look at all those early movies, all of them had accents. Very few did not. Maybe George Stevens. There were some who were really completely entrenched here, but some of them were all, they came from Germany or Poland, Hungary, Michael Curtiz came from Hungary, and so on and so forth. Sweden, and I think by coming with a clear point of view and being further away, sometimes, not always, I must say, sometimes it can help you better. So that's why I admired all those directors from all those European countries who came here, and even Hitchcock was a European. <laughs> I mean, his first movie here, like an American movie, was Rebecca. This was the first scene I shot in the movie, when the, the, the crossfire between the two fires, you know, between the land. And I, it was written on ground, on land, but I put a river between them, so to make it more, give it more quality and make him walk in the water and splash in the water. I mean, it always helps, you know, and add a dimension, something different, another level. And uh, I was waiting actually for a crane for this, a small crane, they call it Swiss Kib. And uh, I waited like one hour, it wouldn't come, it was always late and this. I really delayed me the first day. But I finished the scene and everything, but I had to wait for the Swiss Kib to come. So that's the first scene. So, you know, he starts killing people and everything and you don't know, <laughs> you still don't know them in your head before you shoot the movie, which is a problem actually. Another problem is that this coat going in the water, it really became all, pulled him down in the water, Kurt. You know, this raincoat, this, it gets all wet and soggy. I think water is a very important element in movies. It gives you another dimension, and whether well, it's a river, a waterfall, uh, and he talks about, he thinks he's walking on water, really. And this, from that here on, it's all the revenge thing and how it ends up with the duel with Ringo. And again, the duels, you always see the duels, the one guy is far away, even like my friend Sergio's pictures. You know, there were duels like that, but I thought the more interesting one was the one going around each other cautiously like cats. I found it more interesting as a duel. Also because I've seen the others so many times. Wide up with my friend. Hell, I got lots of friends. I don't. I think having passion for a movie and loving the characters in it and trying to make it as beautiful as you can and working very close, like I worked close with Bill Fraker, great cameraman. I worked also with Jack Cardiff. I, I like to work mostly with older gentlemen who had more experience because uh, Are you all right? I like to admire my cameraman. I don't want to talk down to him. It's your friends that did it. You know, it makes a big difference, you know. Bill Franklin did Bullet, for example, and uh, Jack Cardiff did the African Queen and all those other great movies. He cursed them for cowards and they shot him. I don't understand any of this. Having worked as an assistant director, I know how long I have for each scene to finish it. I know that the speed, which is very important in making a movie, because some directors just go in and they don't know when, you know, I know how much time I have left or how much I can do more or what corner I can cut and put another corner. That has helped me. So it's the organization that has helped me. But also what has helped me is the location, finding locations. I still repeat, location is a very important factor. If you have a room, how the room looks can help you how to shoot that scene, how to bring out things. I mean, there's maybe a mirror there that with that mirror you can play, or it can be a cup or a bowl of fruits or, you know, every little thing. So a location or the props in a location, whether interior or exterior, the set dressing can help you with the scene tremendously when you're rehearsing. I like to rehearse one just to get the feel of it. And then I let the actors go and do makeup and all that. And this way I can set the shots and everything. And then they they forgot what they did with me before, the, that half hour. So when they come back, they're fresher and they can be more spontaneous in the scene. You know, each one works different, I guess. I gotta find a place to hold up. Doc. <laughs> Got it. 
My surprises on this movie were the heat was unbelievable. People were fainting like flies. Gatorade was selling a lot those days. And the amount of scorpions, I, saw, I never saw so many scorpions, I attracted by the heat. And then that you couldn't move, in, at dusk, you couldn't move near the, long, the grass, or because the snake, it's snake feast time at dusk. I know you boys have got to keep moving. But I still love Arizona. I love the skies. They have the most beautiful skies in the world. I mean, really, huge skies. Yeah. Howard Hawks worked exactly. Red River was done exactly where I do all the gunfight, the shootouts and stuff. Rio, Howard Hawks, mostly Howard Hawks worked a lot there. Rio Bravo, Red River, was all shot around that area. I don't know who else was there, to be honest, but I know that they did. Because Mitchum did a few movies there, and he told me about it. When I first met him, I said, hello, my name is George Cosmat. He says to me, I don't doubt it. So he cut the, he broke the ice right away. I started laughing, you know, I don't doubt it. And uh, very nice man, actually. I'm a big fan. Sorry, I was a big fan of his in the old days from the... I mean, one of my favorite movies of his, and he, it's one of his favorite. Heaven Knows Mr. Allison, that John Ford directed with him and Deborah Carr. Thank you. Uh, a little unknown classic to some people. I have to go. Wait. I like the show with the silhouettes and everybody and the sunset and the, the stage going away. I like this composition. You see, the green is not much in this picture because of the time we shot it. So it has a. So every time I can go to a green location which has some trees, I rush to it, you know. This is the area where they shot Red River, exactly here. This scene, okay, was cut again because of time, and that scene shows you that McMasters has joined with them, with our group, with the good guys group, let's say. And, uh, and then you see him in the film being dragged dead, oh, sure. but you don't see what happens, the confrontation between the outlaws, bet between Ringo and him, and Ike Clanton. And then again was a very important scene that was needed to be, stay in the film, I think. And uh, it was a rainy day and you have this wonderful look. And I also like the Suarez. This is the only scene in the movie that has Suarez because you're not allowed to work in, within the, the park system with, with, with the Suarez, the Suarez Park because they had so much problems with films before. So I like the look and I like the confrontation between the three of them. You're the boss. Hey. Tom, just one thing. How are you going to get back to him? I was always worried that nobody would understand who was being pulled. And we put the voiceover, it says McMaster, somebody that? says, in the voiceover to explain it. But I thought it was a cheap way out. So now in this beautiful Vista DVD, you can have it. Masters. You know, with actors, it's important to be able to treat them like human beings and friends and to treat everybody like we're in the same boat. And if we put holes in the boat, we'll all sink. So we have to work together. And I'm never arrogant about if somebody comes and tells me, what about if I do this? I know I have the final decision. So I listen to everybody because of, of all the other actors if they have an idea. Because you never know, there could be a gem or it could be something new that I can use to my advantage. And for the advantage, mostly for the film. And so going in, you have to be a friend, you have to be a psychiatrist, and you have, because you have to, you're walking in a, nobody knows each other. You walk in a movie and everybody, most people don't know each other. It's like walking in a minefield. So you have to know how to walk around the minefield without having anything explode. That's the whole secret. So that's why sometimes it's better to use the same people you know, so the minefield becomes less dangerous. Just chasing my tail. Now for the first time I know exactly what I want. In movies, at the end of the day, you have to compromise. Everybody compromises. 
But the secret is how to be able to maneuver it that you compromise the least. This is the, like the, the struggle. The no, you can't do this because we don't have the money for that. Well, you can go there, but you cannot go here. You know, and you have to compromise. So you have to be quick with your wits and, and be quick to be able to compromise as fast as possible without endangering the quality of the film. What does he need? And I think the film is the most important thing in, in, in a situation. The film, the motion picture, the movie that you're making. And you have to do it with love and, uh, and love of movies, most of it. If you don't love movies, you should be out of them. I'm not doing movies like I'm fixing a car or waiting in a restaurant. I'm doing movies with love. And if you cannot do it with love, it's better not to do them. I really mean it. Because it's one year of my life as a director. A director for, sees through everything. Like now we're doing this with a voiceover. This is how many years later. I have to come. It's work for me. It's work for others, but it's work for me. So it continues. I worry about the advertising, how they're going to put the poster, and uh, so on and so forth. But it's great fun. Grazie and ciao. Bravo. I'm sorry, Wyatt. It's all right, Doug. What's it like to wear one of those? I love working on a location. It's a new place. You can set dress it. You can make something out of it. When you're going on a stage, it's coal, cement. They try to build stages, but it's, you feel the factory feeling. Whatever they do with it, it's still the factory feeling. The big buildings and that. So maybe it's psychological, but I love working in real locations, even if there's rooms are crumpled up. Sometimes you may need to build a set, but usually, most of my movies, I shot them all in real locations, except a few rooms and stuff in the state. And also, making a movie is also fun, because you see new places, new locations, new people. When you're at the studio, it's like going to the office again. This is the big scene of the, of the duel here. He's waiting for you by the big oak. Quarter mile up that trail. I'm not giving you any safe conduct. Shooting starts, you better kick east in the Mexico line. I ain't got the words. I know. Friendship and brotherhood and love is everything. And hope. Hope is very important in life. See? So that's why I think this movies bond people together. Like, that's why a movie like The Godfather worked, because it's a story about a brotherhood. Whether it's bad or good or evil, it's a different story. But it was a family. Family is very important. And uh, the friendship of two men, or two men and a woman, or two women, it's important. Because uh, what will we do without friendship? There's nothing left. Except the bird singing or something. But there's nothing left except friendship. We started a game we never got to finish. <clears throat> Play for blood, remember? I was just fooling about. I wasn't. And this time... It's legal. I shot this movie in this location. I went three times because we had a lot of problems with the rain and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, but... Uh, I liked it because it had all the leaves on the ground, so the high angle shots, and it was between trees again, so it had some green in the shades of those moving leaves. This thing, look at all those leaves on the ground. Say when. What I like about it, it's not that you see he's hitting the handle of the gun, he's tapping it like he always did when he was nervous. You see, they established this in the beginning of the film when he's in the bar. And also I like this because it's not the usual gunfight across the street. Even my friend Sergio did those. But 
This was different, and I like that because it was different. Now, maybe if I had seen it a hundred times, I would say the other one is better, but for, for its purposes, it was better. And I like the soft light of, uh, of the scene, the soft light of the trees, and suddenly Kurt coming. It was all like backlit, so you don't know who is who here. I'm afraid the strain was more than he could bear. Wasn't quite as sick as I made out. Oh, God. My hypocrisy goes only so far. All right. Let's finish it. Indeed, sir. I like what he says. White turp and his immortals. I like that very much. It's a, it's a bit flowery, but I like it. So here is the end of the cowboys. He throws the scarf, and by throwing the scarf, without making too much uh, stories about it, you see that it's they, they finished the cowboys. And then I like it the shake hands riding the horses. I've never seen two people shake hands while they're riding horses. And this was a helicopter. I used helicopters in that. I had them only for a few hours. The helicopter. I tried to steal as much as many shots as possible with a helicopter. And then we had to find a building that looked like Colorado for his sanatorium. So we found a building that had the, near it a pine tree or some tree that shows Colorado. Qui vivis, the great nostrum secula seculorum, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Benoni patris, fili, et spiritu sancti. Amen. When I saw this location, this room, it was a dirty room in, in, in Tucson. And I opened up and I said, what's in there? He says, nothing. I said, I want you to paint this white and make it all white. And this is the hospital. <laughs> so it's in Tucson, in, in, the, in the studio. Oh, wow. So, and we put the wall behind the window. Do you see the wall is like a poster or something to make you think that it goes on? But it's really, it was a, a set that nobody used. My hypocrisy knows no bounds. You know, hypocrite doc, you just like to sound like one. I brought you something. Well, let's see. Where are we today? Yeah, I'm seventeen dollars down to you. Two bits of hand, stud. I keep coming back here. I told you not to in a minute. You're the only person I can afford this scene, we worked very hard to make it work better, the end scene. And we sat day, night after night with Kurt and Val outside in the, by the pool of the hotel. That was a really bad hotel, I must say. But I don't want to say more about it. All right, Doc. All right, how many cards you want? And uh, we were discussing how to make it still better. So we worked on that scene a lot. And the cards and all that stuff. And him to give you more emotion about his death. I call. You went here with all. Very tough scene. And I, it's one of my favorite scenes. I was in love once. My first cousin. She was 15. We were both so. That's good, Doc. 
That's that's good. What happened? She joined a convent over the affair. She was all I ever wanted. What did you want? Just to live a normal life. There's no normal life. Why? It's just life. To get on with it. Don't know how. Sure you do. Say goodbye to me. Go grab that spirited actress and make her your own. Take that beauty and run. Don't look back. Live every second. Live right up the hill. Live for her. Live for me. Why, if you ever my friend, if you ever had even the slightest feeling for me, leave now. Leave now. Well, people, you know, in the story here, they were all young. And in the, in the past, most people died young. I mean, an, an old man was 50, 60 in those days. But, you know, we've improved slowly to make it 80, 90, you know? Thanks for always being there, Doc. And here we had to print this little booklet, my friend Doc Holliday, written by White Herb. Nobody has ever seen the cover of that book the real cover, so we just guessed here. He, he, he says, oh, I'm damn, that's funny. And he looks at his legs, his feet, and he has, wears no boots. So in other words, he, we always thought he would get killed in some gunfight in some town, in some street, and he's dying, it, he's dying really in bed. He died without his boots on, which was a, a, quite an achievement in those days to die without your boots on. Which reminds me of a film, The Die With Their Boots On, Our Flynn. You see the snow here? This was all done in Tucson. This is all fake. Good night, Josie. It's not Good real. Night. I put people with umbrellas and everything to give you the idea that it's snowing. You know, it's in Col Somebody said, oh, it's so cold here in Colorado. So you know it's Colorado because who's gonna know? And then, then she's in this room full of, I like it because it's full of candles and they glisten the from the, the mirrors and stuff. And he comes and sees her. Oh, there's California. And you swear you're looking at heaven. When I shot that intimate scene, I don't have more than, four, we're not more than five people in the scene, just to left. make it more intimate for the actors and for everyone to get the maximum. Right. I think both of these guys did a great job here acting this no, scene, I don't even know how well and I'm very proud of it. I promise I'll love you the rest of your life. Don't worry, Wyatt. My family's rich. I like what she says, my father has money. <laughs> <sighs> what should we do first? What you wanted to do the first night we met. Remember? Uh, may I have this dance? And then they dance, which I thought was a good thing. I had an argument with some people that want to show them in the sunset on the beach in California. I said, let's do it in the snow, because the snow is a contrast to all the desert we've seen. The power of the cowboy gang was broken forever. Ike Clanton was shot and killed two years later during an attempted robbery. Mattie died of a drug overdose shortly after she left Tombstone. Virgil and Allie Earp moved to California where Virgil, despite the use of only one arm, became a town sheriff. Wyatt and Josephine embarked on a series of adventures. Up or down, thin or flush, in 47 years they never left each other's side. Wyatt Earp died in Los Angeles in 1929. Among the pallbearers at his funeral were early Western movie stars William S. Hart and Tom Mix. Tom Mix wept. One of the things I like about the script was it ended the way it ended. And I had an argument that wanted me to change the end of the, the narration. And what I liked about it says, in his uh, funeral, Tom Mix wept. And I found it very touching that Tom Mix, the great hero of my youth from comic books, was that this man's funeral and he wept. William S. Hart was the other person. 
big hero in movies. And I love that line. Tom makes web. Uh, this movie meant, meant a lot to me because I had a great time doing it and I had a great ball with all those actors. Although it was tough work, we all enjoyed ourselves as much as possible, as much under the circumstances. It was a tough shoot, 62 days doing all this stuff. It wasn't very easy. But uh, I sat one day having a sandwich in the middle of the street of Tombstone here. And I said, what a lucky guy. I'm doing this movie a period movie of the period with all those great heroes and I'm doing it here in this street and I, I enjoyed the, the feeling and uh, I had great help from a great cameraman Bill Fraker and uh, a great cast Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer, Michael Bean, Powers Booth, Robert Burt and everybody else uh, Dana Delaney, Sam Elliott Sam Elliott would watch everything. He's like a specialist about westerns. He would watch the... Oh, maybe there are not enough horses in that corner. There. He was a great guy. What I came out of it is that uh, when you have heart in a movie, that's what counts. The movie has to have a heart. And all the guns in the world and all the machine guns and helicopters don't mean anything. And uh, a little bit of research, a bit of hard work, and watching some old movies can help. <laughs> After the end of the movie, when Val shaved his mustache and he came over, I didn't even recognize him. I was so used to him. With a, he says hello, and he said it's all happy. I'm... This movie is dedicated to my dearest wife. Birgitta Jungberg Cosmatos, uh, uh, who passed away after the movie was shot, but it was dedicated to her anyway, and who I love dearly. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy it.